Good evening, everybody at Landmark Baptist Church, our friends and family of our ministry. We're glad that you're joining us tonight for our midweek Bible study and prayer time and uh, jumping back into the book of James tonight, starting into chapter number three. And so we're excited about that in our study. This is our sixth lesson in the study of James. Uh, so far, all of these have been online. I am hoping and praying that by the end of this study in the book of James, that we will be meeting in person again. I have no guarantees for that. Uh, I don't have any more information than you do, but I am praying that way, that by the time we finish the study of the book of James, uh, at least in some capacity, uh, even if it's in smaller groups than normal, we're going to be, I hope, I pray that we're going to be meeting together again. I want to try to uh, keep it positive this evening. I've been uh, thinking about and praying about a lot of things this week, um, trying to uh, plan toward our future. Uh, our school has been, our school ministry has been gearing up, ra ramping up into the last three weeks of school, uh, which is pretty amazing to think about and exciting, I'm guessing, for the kids. We're entering at least into May, our last month of school for most, for many of our uh, elementary, junior high, and high school students from our church. And so uh, we hope that all of you are doing well in those school fashions. We've been planning some things about graduation here at our church within our school ministry, trying to plan how we will handle um, a, a graduation ceremony. We want to still make it special and um, exciting for them but we obviously have some restrictions. So been planning, working on that this week. Uh, something that we're going to do as a church, uh, we're going to be contacting and reaching out to all of the graduates from within our church. And when we meet again in person, when we're able to do that, uh, I know that many of our students, now you can think about college graduates, high school graduates, and even kindergarten graduates, um, are not going to have for the most part, at least not on schedule, their normal graduation process. Uh, we have a number. We have three or four in the college range in our church that are graduating, uh, five in our teen ministry, another five or six in our K-5 class. And so we're going to kind of have a graduation night at some point this summer, um, whenever we're able to come back together and spend an evening kind of honoring those graduates, uh, letting them, if they want to wear their cap and gown, they can do that and, and we'll kind of honor them in front of uh, everybody and give a charge to them, uh, an encouragement and a challenge to each of our graduates. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, our people this week and uh, what each of us are experiencing. And that's really been on my heart and mind, our school age kids and all that they're experiencing these last few weeks. So been working on those things this week, been working on summer plans this week. Uh, we are scheduled uh, for a, a week or two of teen camp and a junior camp week. Of course, we have our Kids Quest, our Vacation Bible School scheduled. And so looking at the dates again on all of those things and, and kind of keeping an eye on what the camps are going to be doing, um, making some other plans for some different fellowships and things this summer. So uh, I, I am in the mindset. I'm, I'm not one of those that, well, if you think it, it's going to happen, I'm praying it, that it will happen. And I hope that you're praying too, that we can get back to um, not just our normal lives, but within our church, uh, a functional way to meet in person. And um, I, I'm, regardless of what people may say, if you could listen and, and hear a hundred uh, different opinions and it'll be a hundred different ways on it. And um, uh, I'm, I'm praying, I'm trying to think positive that uh, we can see the end, the light in the end of the tunnel, if you want to call it that. Um, I'm not saying that it's all going to be gone, poof, just uh, gone from us within a few weeks. I think this is going to change the way a lot of people function for uh, a pretty good amount of time. But uh, I am ready and hopeful that we can... Um, restore some of the things that we look forward to as a church. So I've been planning summer things. I've uh, been working on some dates to meet in person. Now, I'm not ready yet to announce we're coming back on such and such a day uh, because we do not fully know yet what our uh, state plans are. Keeping an eye on that, I think that next week there will be, end of this week, beginning of next week, there will be some 
uh, significant announcements there that give us a clue as to how we can operate um, and, and maybe if we can phase back in with some smaller gatherings and smaller groups and then eventually extend into our normal church gatherings and bodies. But I, I have some dates in mind that I'm praying toward. I don't want to announce them just yet um, so that we don't uh, put ourselves in a spot in that way. Uh, but I, I've been planning those things out. We've been getting some physical things done around the church. Um, our, we've been uh, continuing to amp, uh, ramp up some things on our website. Our kids page is updated again. There's a missionary, a new missionary story on there. Uh, there'd be some new Bible lessons, trying to put three different videos on there per week and update some of those things. And uh, so a lot going on here in our church. And many of you have been still engaging with each other. And many of you have been engaging in what's going on in the life of our church. And I'm thankful for that. I want you to take your Bible and look at James chapter 3. And I want you to uh, go get your worksheet from online. In fact, I'm going to give you a chance in just a moment to go do it. Of course, you can pause me and go get it. Uh, but download it, print it, uh, if you can print it, or have it on another device so that you can look over it as we study James chapter 3. An important lesson tonight. All of God's words are important. Uh, but especially tonight, something that we all, every one of us in our church, deal with on a daily basis. And so we have, uh, I'm going to pull up here in a moment, we have a recording of one of our young ladies, one of our graduates that I just mentioned. Gabby Ferguson is graduating from West Coast uh, Baptist College. Um, she'll be finished here in the next few weeks. And you pray for her as she prays about God's leading in her life and uh, a graduation tentatively scheduled, I believe, in August uh, that she'll be able to go walk uh, and go through the ceremony part of things. So we're praying for Gabby. Gabby just had her senior piano recital. She is a uh, piano and music major, and uh, she has to perform. She was supposed to perform uh, live uh, before some of those there at the college and uh, was not able to do so in person, and they had to record her uh, piano recital. So I'm going to play you a, a selection from her senior piano recital, a sacred piece, uh, the words, part of the words come from Psalm number 8. And, uh, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Uh, her brother Jack recorded this uh, for her, and they've submitted it. And then he sent it to me, he sent a copy of it to me, so that we can share with you tonight. So while Gabby's playing, uh, if you want to pull up on your phone or another device that worksheet, or if you want to pause and go print it, make sure that you have that. You can find it on our website title page or at lbcrichmond.com slash James. And I'm going to go ahead and put up for you uh, Gabby playing, and then as soon as she's done, uh, we'll come back and start into our study of James chapter 3. <music>
right, and uh, we're grateful, thankful for Gabby being a part of our ministry. And um, in some ways, it's it's good to have some of our college students home in this, but it's unfortunate that we're not together um, to experience some of this together. But you pray for Gabby and our other college students. Uh, yeah, the white sides were by uh, the church today and got to talk to them a little bit and some of the things they're doing finishing up some college classes in the next few weeks. So pray for each of our students these last few weeks from K-4 all the way to master students. And um, just pray for each of them as they finish up their year. Um, it's a, a unique way for each of them to finish, I'm sure, but we're praying the best for each of them. And even when we spend our time at the end tonight in prayer, um, take some time and especially pray uh, for some of those that you know from our church uh, that are going through some of these things now. Uh, I'm going to prepare, put some things up on the screen for you here, and i got to remember where the screen is because um, I can kind of see it, but then when I put up my screen, uh, I'll let you in on the background. If I were to move over here, actually, you might enjoy this a little bit more. Uh, I might should stay here because then you get the benefit, you get to over here, you get to look at my kids' pictures. Uh, man, it's backwards, this way. You get to look at my kids' pictures um, up here. There's some of my wife but and myself um, and then some other things. But I, I guess I should um, come back out for you. I just got to remember which side of the screen I'm on tonight. Um, take your Bible and look at James chapter 3. And um, I hope, again, that you are doing well. Um, I'm praying for each of you. And I hope that God will continue to um, bless our church in spite of the fact we're not together yet. It's coming. I promise it is coming. We're hanging in there and continue to support each other and uh, to grow in Christ. James 3, and take your introduction section there of your printout. And uh, let's go ahead and um, let me start by way of introduction and then we'll read our passage together. And you have some questions there at the beginning um, that you can kind of take a, take a moment and look at. Uh, how much do you think that you talk during a day? Uh, how much do you think you talk during a week? How many words do you think you speak in a lifetime? And our thought tonight is that faith controls our words and our speech. That that is one way we should reflect what we believe about God and what we believe about Christ, what we believe about others because of that from God's Word should be reflected in the way that we speak and in the way that we talk. So that's our topic tonight is our words, our speech. And it's something that we all deal with on a regular basis. And uh, it gives you some of the averages there and I'll give you some more facts in a moment even after we read our passage. But our words are important and God is going to place an emphasis for us tonight from James 3 on how we speak, how we use our words. So let's look, if you would, at James uh, chapter 3. Look at verse number 1 and we'll read down through verse number 12. And again, like we've encouraged you the last few weeks, now's a good time if you would like to pause and read this um, together as a family. Uh, family worship, family devotions are important. So if you want to read it uh, back and forth to each other, if you want to read it all together, I will not be offended if you skip my reading of this as long as you read it together as a family during uh, this time of worship. So look at James chapter 3, look at verse number 1. It says, My brethren, be not many masters. That means don't all of you be teachers, uh, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the, in the horse's mouths, that they may, be, may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are and are driven of fierce winds. Yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds, 
and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we man, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the mouth of out of the mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Ought not so be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same places sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. And we're going to look at this tonight, what God's Word teaches us about the way that we speak. Let's ask the Lord to bless tonight as we learn from His Word about our words. Father, thank You for Your goodness to us and Your grace. we thankful that even in a topic like this of our mouths, our speech, and our words, where we fail You, maybe more often than in any other aspect of life, we fail you here, but we're thankful that you're merciful to continue to teach us, that you're patient to continue to allow us to grow, and we pray that you would help us and guide us by your Spirit and to the Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray, amen. Okay, take your sheet there and let's uh, look back up at your introduction section tonight as we look into James chapter 3, and obviously there's some strong words, some strong language here. So what is God trying to teach us? What is He introducing us to? Uh, let's go back and uh, just talk a little bit about our study in general. We have been talking about the fact that a theme of the book of James is that true faith produces faithful Christ-like works. James is not teaching that we do works for our salvation. He's not teaching that your words tonight we're talking about words. He's not teaching that those will save you, but he is teaching that they will be a reflection of what God is doing in your life. Works are not simply deeds and rules and duties. Works is your lifestyle. And obviously your words, our words are part of our lifestyle. So I want to think about this. I already asked you the question, how much do you talk in a day? And you have some of the statistics there. On average, this is an average. Some of us, this may be a lot more than others. Some of this, it may be a lot less. It may depend on the day or our attitude or our mood. But on average, a person's words would fill a 50-page book per day. And that is about 132 different books of 200 pages each per year. Uh, so you could write 132 books with your words every year. It is estimated that on average we spend 20% of our awake, our conscious life, 20% of it is spent speaking or communicating. So it is a huge, a huge part of our lives. And it's going to be emphasized here in God's Word. In fact, we, we phrased it this way, uh, that James spends a significant amount of this chapter, a significant amount of time teaching us about the power of our speech. God cares about your speech. He cares what you say. He cares how you say it. He cares how you speak to people and how you handle your conversations on a daily basis. We speak a lot. As we just mentioned, there's a lot of words that are involved in our lives. And to think about it in terms of James chapter 3, go back to verse number 10. It says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. You can do either one. Now when it says cursing, it's not just speaking about curse words in the sense of profanity. It is speaking about uh, negative words, evil words, slander, uh, lies, bitterness, um, uh, aggressive speech, angry speech. It is speaking about evil words. And so James is emphasizing the fact that if we speak so many words, there's a lot of opportunities in a day to speak Good things, blessings, or bad things, cursings. You think about that 50-page book today. Today, okay? Oh, I think most of you are going to be watching this in the evening. Your words today, your 50-page booklet, was it mostly good things or was it mostly bad things? Was it good things mostly but then small amount of negative mixed in? I don't know about you, if I read an article or a book, and most of it is good, and then all of a sudden it just is destroyed by an opinion or 
just really goes off the rails, it doesn't, it, it discounts the whole entire book. So a small portion of your book for the day, a small portion of your words for the day can destroy the whole rest of what you lived for and what you were trying to accomplish in the day because our words are powerful. Think of how drastically words affect your daily life. Uh, you could listen to words 24 hours a day. You could listen to five conversations. If you turned on the TV, the radio, the internet on your computer, and turned on something on your phone, you could listen to people talk all day long. And think about, even this last few months, think about how uh, the way someone talks affects how you feel, how you act, how you think. Somebody's opinion can totally change in some ways the way that you think. Somebody's tone can change the way that you feel inside. Um, a, a negative or a positive statement could give you a bright or a dark outlook on your day. Our words are powerful. Uh, our words are important. I want you to think of how Jesus used his words. I wrote down some things on your uh, sheet there that Jesus used his words to teach, to minister, to move people, to express his care, to express his concern and love. He used words to rebuke. He used words to encourage. In fact, go back to the Gospels. If you had a red letter Bible and, and scan through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a, a high percentage of what we know historically about Jesus' life are his words. It's what he taught, especially you get into portions of John and that we've been studying uh, recently. Uh, it's just chapter after chapter of Jesus teaching. Think of Matthew and all that he expressed in the uh, Sermon on the Mount and the parables that he taught. Jesus used his words. Our words are important. So by way of introduction, let's just lay this part or lay this thought out there. Our words matter. They matter to us. They matter to our lives. They matter to our God. And so if our words matter to our God, if he's going to make this big of a deal about it, we should be thinking. We can't be flippant with our words. We cannot uh, treat our words as though they do not matter. Our words matter. And so what I want to do is I want to walk back through the passage. Uh, think about the different illustrations that James uses. And uh, in your um, family discussion personal study section, I encourage you to do this. You can even do it on our way through. Uh, I encourage you to highlight, if you have a certain color highlighter or a certain color pen, circle or highlight um, the different things that um, the tongue is compared to. Uh, we're going to see them in a moment. There's six or seven different things in this portion of Scripture that he compares. And so let's take those illustrations first. On your uh, worksheet, it says words illustrated, our words, our speech. How, does, how is it illustrated? And we're going to look at those illustrations, expound a little bit on each one, and then go back and draw our points from that, the emphasis that God is trying to make about our words. Look at the list here that you have or the list on your sheet. Verse number three it says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. You think about the power of horses. We even, for some reason, refer to uh, our car's power uh, as horsepower. Think about the uh, significant that they can, they can travel from place to place. They're huge beasts, some of them. Uh, you think about work horses and draft horses that weigh hundreds and hundreds, even more than a thousand pounds. And so you got these different horses that are just massive. They, they're fast. They are strong. But they can be guided by one small little chip of a piece of metal, a, a bit that you put in its mouth, and you can guide it, completely guide it one direction or another. And it compares our lives and our words. We can have big, powerful words. We can have uh, lives. We can have purposeful lives that are driven to one way or another to good things or to failures, uh, to righteousness or to evil. Our lives can be directed by how we speak. Uh, it shows of the power of words. Which is more powerful, the horse or the little bit that goes in its mouth? Well, you could argue in different ways. If you're arguing by uh, results, sure, you could say a horse is more powerful. Uh, a bit can't do what the horse does. But in a way, 
we often could not do with horses what we do without that bit. And so they kind of go hand in hand. Our words affect our lives. You cannot separate what you say from what you do. You cannot separate what you speak from who you are. Uh, sometimes, have you ever caught yourself saying in a conversation, well, I said that, but I really didn't mean it. Um, I said that, but that's not what I meant by that. And then he gives us these other illustrations here. He says, uh, he gives us the example of a very small helm or a rudder in verse number four, a huge ship. Think of a massive cruise ship even in our day steered by, in proportion, a very small piece, a very small section of an engine. Uh, a very small insignificant thing can either shipwreck, uh, completely derail and strand a whole massive ship, or it can guide it to safety. He compares it to a fire in verses five and six. He says, a tongue is a little member, boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. Then again, in verse number six, and the tongue is a fire. Once it has started, it can light and it can consume everything around it. It can destroy many other things. And even though it can begin small, our words can pull down huge portions of the rest of our lives. It can destroy much of the work, much of the ministry even that we have for Jesus Christ in this world can be destroyed. By our words. He uses the example of a tamed or an untamed beast. He said, uh, birds, serpents, uh, land animals, sea animals, mankind can seem to tame almost anything that it wants to. But he says, your tongue is something that is extremely hard. He says, even no man can tame it. Uh, our words, uh, we seem to lose control. What is he saying? We seem to lose control of our words as easily as we lose control of anything else in life. I want you to look at the uh, one of the final things. Uh, it says a poison in verse number eight. No man can tame. It is an unruly, even f- evil, full of deadly poison. Um, what is the comparison? Now think about if you take poison, uh, you ingest it. You can get, be poisoned a number of ways. Uh, say you're poisoned by injection. Does it only poison? You, it's shot into your arm. Does it only poison your arm? No, it poisons the whole body. Uh, If it's put in through your skin, does it only poison your skin? No, it poisons the whole body. If you ingest it, does it only uh, poison your stomach and your digestion? No, it poisons your whole entire body. And poison, our tongue, can poison our whole body, all of our actions. It can poison our spiritual lives if it is not handled properly. So you have these examples, even a fruit tree that's given at the end, or salt and fresh water. You have these illustrations. So what is... What is he trying to teach us here? What is he trying to show us? And there's three main ideas, and they're kind of bolded out for you there. And let's take a look at them. In verses 1 and 2, we have this thought that words show the progress of our faith. Remember, the whole book of James is important in that it's teaching that faith produces works. Our works are not what saves us. Our works display our salvation. He says, your works, your lives, you can't display salvation if you're just sitting around. You can't display salvation if you live in the flesh. You can't display salvation if you live like the old man. You only display salvation through the new regenerated works that God is doing in your life. And your words, your speech are one aspect of that that display the progress of what Jesus is doing in your life. Uh, A Christian that does not speak well, and it could be profanity, it could be cursing, it could be... Uh, dirty speaking. Those are things that could be lumped in there, but it could also be lies. It could be gossip. It could be flattery um, for uh, whatever purpose we use it. It could be sarcasm. Uh, It could be a a biting, sharp tone. It could be a a passive aggressiveness to try to drive down somebody that we're speaking to. All of these things should not be a reflection of what Jesus is doing in our lives. Bad things that come out of our mouth Uh, Evil ways that we speak, ways that we use our words for harm, don't reflect the work that Jesus should should be or that we should have being done in our lives. Notice it says the importance of our words does not simply rest on the results of our words. Our words are a display of our faith in Christ. Now the result of what you say, that is not the only thing by which we measure our words. It can be how we say it the time in which we say it, the spirit in which we say it. So it says, notice if you would in verse number 
uh, 2. For in many things we offend all. That word offend means to stumble, to fall, to err, or transgress. So the verse is not saying in many things we offend everyone. He is saying in many things we all offend. We all fall. We all stumble. You could even say it uh, this way. We all stumble in many ways. Um, But this, he kind of hones in. He says we all stumble in many ways. But we all struggle with our words. There's certain sins that uh, may seem to fade with time or age or uh, experience or, or something in life. We could all be tempted at any age for anything. Uh, but seems like certain people struggle with different temptations and different sins in different ways. But our words seem to be something that we all, we all are tempted. Maybe not the exact same way but is a common area of life. He says, in many ways, we all stumble, but it says, notice, if any man offend, fall or stumble, in, not in word, the same as a perfect man. He says, if you, if you are able to where you don't offend, if you don't fall, if you don't fail, if you don't sin with your words, you are complete. You have bridled your entire body. You should be able to control every other aspect of your life if you can control your words. Now, does anyone have complete control of this? Is anyone sinless in this way? No. But what is he doing? He's showing the importance of our words. Our words reflect to those around us the work that Christ is doing inside of us. Uh, Notice, it says in your sheet, the tongue is a hard thing to tame. In fact, controlling how we speak and speaking in a way that is submissive to the Holy Spirit is a sign that we have significantly advanced our spiritual growth. What do I mean by significantly advanced? He says, if you can bridle your tongue, your entire body can be controlled. Your entire spiritual life, it shows how powerful they are. That's the second point. Words are powerful. And we just had that in all these illustrations. A bit that drives a horse one way or another. A rudder that points or steers a massive ship that can derail and, and send it off, uh, off course or can keep it in line. Your words are that powerful. Your words are like a fire that could start small and explode to something big that affects hundreds. And we've seen even this last year, millions of acres burned from one small thing. Your words are powerful. He says, like a, like a poison that affects your entire body. Your words are powerful. And so when we think that, you don't have to just be a a pastor or a teacher for your words to be important. All of our words are important, regardless of who you are, where you work, or what your age is. Your words affect your lives. Parents, our words affect our children. Uh, They affect our spouse. They can point them to Christ, or they can drastically pull them away from Christ. Our words could point our kids to Christ, or they could point them to the whole wrong thing, the complete wrong mindset. We could point them to themselves. We could point them uh, to us. Our words can direct aspects of our lives, but they can also affect other people's lives. Do you have time? I want you to think for a second and uh, think about your own life. Do you have a time that you can remember and still think about someone in particular's words to you? In it, we'll say in a positive or a negative way. A particular phrase that someone said to you that changed a, a day that you were having a rough day and they changed drastically. A moment in life that was a struggle and what someone said to you drastically changed. How you, handle it. you can leave them in the comments if you want to share uh, some of those things as encouragement. Or you think about it in a negative way. I can remember certain statements that people have said to me. And I I promise you I have tried to forget those, but they still pop into my mind at times. There there are a few phrases that some adults said to me when I was a child um, in different circumstances. And they may have not had malintent. They may not have thought them through. They may not have really uh, meant for them to impact my life long term but there are moments there i can walk in certain rooms even in our church buildings i can walk in certain room and remember a conversation in a certain place that someone said something to me and it hurt me it hurt me uh, because it was about uh, myself personally or, or a friend or a family member and i can remember the exact phrase and no matter how hard i try to forget it it still it still pops into my mind at times um, there is something even recently, that someone said around the time that my dad passed away within a few weeks, 
And I, I know in my heart they did not mean it with malice. They did not mean it mean. It wasn't even really about my dad. It was just sort of about the circumstance of life that I was in at the moment. And it bothered me. What they said bothered me. And no matter how hard I try, I, I seem, I'm not mad at that person for that. I don't, I'm not uh, uh, intensely set against them. But it sticks out in my head. And, I, and, and every now and then I'll, I'll be walking through, I'll do something specific. And that phrase will pop into my mind. Why? Because our words are powerful. Why should we protect our words? Why should we be careful with our words? Because you can say a phrase to someone. And it may be in a moment of frustration for you. It may be in a moment that uh, you had a frustrating day and you mean very little by it. It's simply a quick vent of pressure. But it can stick in that person's mind for the rest of their lives. That's how powerful our words are. Um, you could say something to someone that could turn them like a rudder or like a bit in a horse's mouth that could turn them toward good things. That's how powerful our words are. Our words show the progress of our faith. Our words have power. And finally, our words reflect our thoughts and our choices. Because here is the bottom line. Your words are your words. My words are my words. We have to take possession of them. When I say something, I can't say, well, that's another part of me. I'm not uh, schizophrenic in the sense that I have multiple personalities. And so when I say something, it reveals my choices and it reveals my heart on a subject or an idea. Now, I can repress some words for a certain amount of time. I can fake certain things and phrases. We can all bite our lip and our tongue under certain circumstances. But in general, the Bible teaches that our words, our words reflect the choices of our thoughts. Why are our words important? We have back under the first point, the work of controlling the tongue takes us into the root of all that is wrong with us. It gets us into our hearts. You have some references there in Matthew and in Proverbs and in Luke, and I encourage you to look those up. Uh, but you think about them, it says that out of the heart man speaketh. Out of the heart out of the treasure of a man's heart, out of his thoughts, out of his motives, out of the things deep in his soul. That is where our words come from. This is why our words are powerful. This is why our words are important. This is why, because it reflects our thoughts, our hearts, and our choices. Notice in verse number nine, as we finish up, it says, therewith, with our words, we bless God, yet we can also curse men. We can speak good of God, but bad of men. And then it gives us a, a little side note. It says, men who were created in the image of God. That's who we're speaking evil of sometimes, is those that God created in His own image, in His own likeness. And so he really emphasized that. He said we can bless God, and we can curse those that are in the image of God. He says we can choose to speak good, or we can choose to speak bad. Um, notice verse number 10, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Your words reflect your heart, your emotions, your choices, your thoughts about something. Out of, the, out of your heart you speak. And, and as Proverbs says, or as Psalm says, um, I'll give you the reference there. Proverbs 4, 23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it comes everything else. Out of your heart. Well, that includes your words. So why are words emphasized here? Because they are a display of your heart. They are a display of what God is doing in your life. And so if you have your actions under control, if you have your um, temperament under control, you have uh, uh, some sin uh, under control, you have outward actions under control, but your mouth is not under control, it shows there are still deep problems in your heart. James warns earlier in the, in the book, we've already read it, that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He says a double-minded man can bless God, but curse man. Can speak great of God, but evil of others. Can speak good of some men, but evil of others. And so I want you to look at what it mentions in your, in your bulletin there. It says, if a Christian finds that they speak blessings and sweet encouragements and good things, but can turn around and speak aggressively and harm others... They can be confident that something is wrong in their hearts. You see, notice what it says at the end of verse 10. It gives us that. Out of the same mouth 
precedes blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Could the Lord be any more blunt with how he says this? If your mouth can speak great, but then turn around and speak negative. If it can speak righteousness, but then turn around and speak evil. If it can speak good, but then turn around and speak harm. If it can do that, something is wrong. He says these things should not be. And so sometimes we excuse our words, don't we? There's a book by a man named Jerry Bridges called Respectable Sins. And his mindset or his theme behind the book is sins that we sort of come to accept as just part of our nature. And sometimes words are a respectable sin in a way. Something that we don't necessarily think that we need to focus on. Something that we don't always keep in check. It's as though we shift blame to others. It's as though we have buttons. You know, somebody, uh, we talk, talk a little bit about it. He said, somebody pressed my buttons the wrong way. Well, they're still your buttons. There shouldn't be a button that they could press that we respond that way. Uh, there's not a button on us that says, speak with nasty anger. And somebody just pushes it and it's not our fault. Pfft, here comes all the nasty anger. Or here comes cursings. Or here comes something uh, dirty or lustful out of our mouth. That, that button on us should not be available to people because it should not be in our hearts. And so our words are important because they are powerful, because they show the progress of faith in our lives, because they reflect our hearts and our choices. And let me finish with this final thought, or uh, it gives us sort of an illustration there. It says, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Salt or fresh water, if you think that way. Or fig tree, can a fig tree bear olives? It says, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. If you pour salt water into fresh water, it, it doesn't separate. It becomes brackish water. It becomes, the salt sort of overcomes um, the regular water. If you had two cups and you pour one into them, uh, it's not going to be like, sort. it's still going to be bad. And he says, if some of your words are good and some of your words are bad, they're both just poured into a vat together almost and they both can end up causing harm your evil words can actually harm your good words because if someone hears me speak evil but then they somewhere else they the same person hears me speak good is that person ever going to trust my words well i heard them say this in a really good encouraging way to somebody but then i heard them tear that same person down to somebody else I wonder if they say that of me I wonder if they gossip behind my, if they're going to gossip to me. Uh, you should be careful who you uh, speak to in general, but we shouldn't be gossiping to anyone. Why? Because how is that person ever going to trust your words? How are they ever going to trust what you say about your relationship with Christ? Because when those things are poured together, someone sees both, ugh, it murks up all of what you say to that person. And some of time, sometimes, most of the time, our words, the problem with our words can reveal an identity crisis in our lives. What do we mean by that? Sometimes we feel a need to be perceived as something other than what Jesus wants us to be. Sometimes we want to be perceived as the greatest of whatever it may be. And so we use our words to put others down and prideful words to lift ourselves up. But if we were content with what Christ calls us to be, I don't have to be the greatest at something. I don't have to be the perfect teacher. I don't even have to be the perfect pastor or the best father. Uh, and so when there's conversations, I don't have to be the best husband or, or I don't have to have uh, the uh, perfect wife even for myself. And, and I will defend her and I will speak well of her, uh, but I don't have to try to speak comparisons between her and everyone else else's spouse. I don't have to uh, try to speak compared. Why? Because I am found in Christ. I am a Christian. I am a new creature. Now, when I go to work, I don't have to compare myself with the person that I may be in some competition with for the new uh, spot or the new position in the company. I don't have to fight with that person. So I don't have to gossip about them. I don't have to lie about them. I don't have to be boastful about myself because I find my identity in Christ. But when I build my identity on other things, outside of Jesus. Well, my identity is that I am a great businessman. I am a great person. I am the best, most righteous uh, Christian in the church. And when that is challenged, 
then I use my words to tear others down and to lift myself up. So sometimes our words reveal a deeper identity crisis in our lives that we are not content with what God has called us to be. And so tonight, as we think about our words, as we think about um, what we are in Christ and how it reflects, I want you to ask yourself that question. Go through this family discussion, personal study guide section uh, this evening because uh, it reveals, it shows, it, it will uh, bring up some particular questions about our own lives. Um, how have we personally felt the power of words? How have we recently used the power of words? Which of these illustrations speaks to us about problems with our own words? But we need to get personal with this. We can't just say, I'm going to try to talk better. We need to identify the problems in our lives and where we struggle with this. I, I hope that you will... Um, work on that this week with me because I know that even today I have probably struggled with how I've said things or where and in what way I've said these things. And so I'm praying and I hope that you will pray with me that as a church we'll be a loving and kind church. We're talking to people even though we're not around. You have been talking to someone these last few days. You've been talking to your spouse, your children, uh, whether it's on a conference call. We speak to people and how we speak to people reflects what Christ is doing in our lives. Let's ask the Lord to bless uh, His Word tonight. And uh, I encourage you to go on our uh, website and look at our prayer request tonight and spend time in family worship in prayer. And uh, our missionaries that we're praying for tonight is uh, Larry Lilly and his wife Sharon in Mexico and Joel and Cynthia Dickens in Brazil. Uh, I heard reports this week that Brazil is considered to be kind of the next epicenter maybe of uh, all that's going on with the virus and so we'll be in prayer for uh, these missionaries this week. Let's have a word of prayer and close and then I hope that you as a family will have um, a time of prayer together. Father, thank you for your goodness and your love. We thank you that you teach us about our words. I thank you that we can use our words to pray, that we can use our words to communicate with you, that you have given us your word to hide in our hearts to become our word for it to change and to work in our lives and to magnify your name. We pray that that would be our goal, that we would realize how powerful our words really are and that in turn we would use them for good and not for ourselves, that we would use them for Christ and for the gospel and not for our own motives and desires. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. I love you, church. I hope that you have a great week. I'm praying for each one of you.